This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming uh, to the uh, regular brown bag uh, luncheon at the Peace Studies program. Uh, this week we have a uh, round table, uh, current events round table. Normally we just have the one speaker. In fact, next week's speaker is our colleague Norman Uphoff, who will be speaking about an agricultural innovation in the midst of conflict, the system of rice intensification from Madagascar. My instinct would be not to leap at the chance to hear about this, but um, you should be aware <laughs> that this, this work uh, was, was featured on the front page of the New York Times uh, about a month ago with a very nice picture of our colleague Milton. So there may be more to rice intensification uh, than meets the eye. We're very much looking forward to finding out what made Norm famous. Um, those of you who are not currently receiving uh, electronic uh, bulletins from us, on the table with the cookies are these little pieces of paper you can sign up and get on our, our regular mailing list. There's also, I think, a class here today, and there is, I'm told, a sign-up sheet for that class that they're supposed to attend to in the kind of anteroom uh, to, to GO8. Um, two additional announcements to make uh, before we get started. One is that Ray McGrath, 1997 Nobel Prize Co. Laureate, um, who is currently working on post-war reconstruction and development unit at University of York, will be visiting Cornell next week, September 16th through 19th. Uh, there are no formal events planned for him during his visit next week, but if you are interested in meeting informally with him, uh, please contact David K. Uh, that's DLK2 at cornell.edu uh, to make arrangements to do that. And we would also like to alert you all to uh, the first uh, foreign policy distinguished speaker uh, of the Anaudi Center uh, this year. That's uh, our own, uh, I say our own because he's a Cornell grad. Uh, Steve Krasner, uh, who was uh, at Stanford University and former director of uh, policy planning staff at the Department of State, who will be speaking, uh, Can America Find a Grand Strategy? We'll see what he does. I would assume that's a quick no, right? Uh, so, but uh, Steve will speak for uh, at greater length than that and, and fill us in, and we're looking forward to that very much. Uh, today, we're extremely pleased to uh, have three uh, very distinguished speakers for our uh, roundtable uh, 911 plus 7. Um, they will speak in reverse alphabetical order, and that is the order in which I will introduce them, even though that is not the order that, in which they are seated. Um, so we have Barry Strauss, professor of history and classics uh, here at Cornell, and Barry is also a former director uh, of the Peace Studies program, uh, the author of five books, including, I believe, most recently, although perhaps this has been superseded, uh, The Battle of uh, Salimus, which was named one of the best books of 2004 by the Washington Post. Uh, sitting uh, appropriately to Barry's left, I believe, uh, is uh, Peter Katzenstein, uh, Walter S. Carpenter, Jr., professor of international studies, at Cornell University, uh, and the president-elect of the American Political Science Association, uh, Professor Kassenstein's uh, many uh, publications. I think the most, perhaps, noteworthy for this, uh, this talk is a project that he ran with Bob Cohane on anti-Americanisms in world politics, uh, which was published by Cornell University Press in 2007. And finally, to my left, also appropriately, uh, we have the most recent director of the Peace Studies program, uh, Matt Evangelista, um, who will, whose comments will draw on his recent book that he'll now hold up for you, um, Law, Ethics, uh, and the War on Terror, uh, uh, copies available in the lobby. Um, <laughs> and so with that, I will turn it over to Barry. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, my colleagues and I have been on several panels together, and I'm, I'm used to being a thorn between two roses. So um, <clears throat> I'm glad to be here today, um, back where they give cookies. I, I want to talk about the, uh, my subject is the military history uh, of um, the seven years since 9-11, uh, 2001. And I want to begin with just two, two framing points. Um, the first is that um, these years have obviously been a time of war. And in war, as you know, truth is the first casualty. Um, I, many of the facts and figures that I would like to be uh, throwing out today are very difficult to uh, ascertain, are very difficult to pin down. And so that would be my excuse for not having any facts or figures. The second framing point is that 
there's an election going on in this country. You probably are unaware of that. And, and being in an election year, of course, our, our emotions, our passions are particularly engaged, uh, uh, particularly, uh, particularly alive. Uh, talking about these issues of, of war and peace will certainly bring up uh, thoughts of the campaign. I will do my best to suppress all thoughts of the campaign, to try to speak without fear or favor, uh, and to tell it uh, as, uh, as I see it in a way that would make, that would offend both major candidates. So um, at the time of 9-11, uh, on September 11, 2001, we were told that everything had changed, that the world would never be the same again. And we were also told in the intervening years uh, that we were witnessing a new way of war, that there had been a revolution in military affairs and that war would never be the same again. Uh, I'd like to suggest, contrary and I'm a, that I am, that both of these propositions are false, that it's not true that everything changed, uh, and it's not true that we are witnessing a new way of war. Though indeed, there have been some changes and certainly there have been new developments in warfare. Instead, I think uh, what we saw since 9-11 was a call to return to the basics, uh, to return to the classics. And in fact, the traditional way of analyzing war uh, using uh, thinkers such as Sun Tzu and Clausewitz is more relevant than ever. So, so with that in mind, I want to talk today about uh, military affairs, first from the point of view of al-Qaeda, uh, and second from the point of view of the United States. So if we look at the attacks of 9-11, uh, the attacks on the United States, if we look at them from al-Qaeda's point of view, it seems to me uh, that these were an excellent example of what Sun Tzu calls formlessness attacking the enemy in a way, such a way that you have no form, no visible form, that the enemy can't even recognize you or see you. Uh, Al-Qaeda did an excellent job of carrying out such an attack on 9-11, uh, and a largely very successful one. What was the purpose? What was the point of attacking the Pentagon, um, the uh, World Trade Center, uh, and uh, apparently a, an, an attempt on the U.S. Capitol as well? I don't think al-Qaeda thought that there was any chance that these attacks would knock the United States out, uh, that, would, uh, that these attacks uh, would deprive the United States, would, would um, end the United States being an adversary of theirs. They're much too sophisticated for that. Rather, I think that the purpose of these attacks from al-Qaeda's point of view was to draw the United States into a war in the Middle East, a war for Muslim public opinion. I think from al-Qaeda's point of view, the purpose of the attacks was to force the United States to overplay its hand uh, in a way that would cause a pen, public opinion in the Muslim world to rise up in support of al-Qaeda, in support of its jihadist agenda, and that would allow al-Qaeda to achieve its aims. And what are its strategic aims? Strategic aims were the takeover of a state, or rather the takeover of a more significant and more central state than Afghanistan, preferably Arabia, and ultimately to establish a new caliphate. And as a way of doing this, it wanted to drive the United States out of the Muslim world. Did al-Qaeda achieve these goals? Well, clearly to date, not. What then was the American counter strategy? How did the United States respond to al-Qaeda's attack? It seems to me that the American counter strategy was to identify, was to say that its, its role would be to take on the global jihadist movement as spearheaded by al-Qaeda, and to identify as the center of gravity Muslim public opinion. Indeed, this is in a way the same center of gravity, the same target that al-Qaeda was aiming at. Both the United States and al-Qaeda wanted to speak to the Muslim world. Uh, the United States' response to al-Qaeda uh, was a response, both a diplomatic and a military response. On the military level, it wanted to attack, respond to al-Qaeda with military force. It wanted, first of all, to defeat al-Qaeda. Secondly, to show that the United States is, to use the term of, uh, that Ms. bin Laden used, to show that the United States is the strong horse. Third, the United States wanted to do something to support Democrats and support pro-Western forces in the, in the Muslim world. 
On the uh, rhetorical level, this included an apology for 50 years of having supported tyrants in the Muslim world. On the military level, it included the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. American strategy in Afghanistan in 2001 was to deprive al-Qaeda of its base in Afghanistan, which meant uh, uh, driving the Taliban from power, the Taliban being the regime that allowed al-Qaeda to set up uh, bases in Afghanistan. The Americans did not engage in a massive invasion of Afghanistan. Rather, they sent in a small number of troops. They worked with allies uh, in Afghanistan, anti-Taliban forces in Afghanistan, and they used, brought to bear, a massive amount of air power. These efforts proved adequate to take the cities of Afghanistan and to drive the Taliban out of the countryside and to drive al-Qaeda out of the countryside, but only temporarily. The Taliban and al-Qaeda were able to find bases in Pakistan. The American response since then has largely been a fairly weak one in terms of pursuing the enemy in Pakistan. I'll come back to that in a moment at the end of my talk. But the American strategy has largely been one of not destabilizing Pakistan. Pakistan having a very complicated relationship with the United States and uh, with al-Qaeda and the Taliban. In the meantime came the war in Iraq. The goal of the war in Iraq, it seems to me, was to create an Iraqi beachhead for democracy. To speak to the second part of the American strategy, was to support, which was to support Democrats and pro-Western forces in the uh, Islamic world. At the same time, driving out a long-term enemy and irritant, Saddam Hussein, a, a man who was an ally of al-Qaeda, though certainly not uh, a member of al-Qaeda himself, uh, and uh, a representative of a, reg of a regime uh, um, which, although sympathetic to the attacks of 9-11, certainly could not be shown to have played any significant role in those attacks. The American strategy, uh, the American uh, strategic goal in Iraq, clearly was not supported by the correct operational strategy. The Bush administration made a major error in its operational strategy and its attack in uh, Iraq because it misidentified the enemy's center of gravity. Now, Clausewitz, writing about war, says, and I quote, the first, the supreme, oops, I need my glasses, sorry. The first, the supreme, the most far-reaching act of judgment that the statesman and commander have to make is to establish the kind of war on which they are embarking, neither mistaking it nor trying to turn it into something that it is alien to its nature. This is the first of all strategic questions and the most comprehensive. Clearly, the Bush administration made a mistake. Uh, in its assumption that the center of gravity of, uh, in Iraq was the Iraqi army. Defeat the Iraqi army and you won the war. Well, perhaps that wouldn't be enough. Occupy the Iraqi capital. Occupy Baghdad and you win the war. That wasn't enough. Capture and kill the Iraqi leader, Saddam Hussein, or turn him over uh, for trial and execution. That wasn't enough. Clearly, the center of gravity in Iraq was the Iraqi people and the threat to the Iraqi people from a classic guerrilla insurrection, an insurgency, an insurgency in which al-Qaeda was quick to seize the opportunity that the Americans gave them to establish themselves into Iraq and to attack uh, American friends and American power. Fortunately, America's generals had read uh, Mao Zedong. Mao argues in Strategy in China's Revolutionary War, and I quote, the process of knowing a situation goes on not only before the formulation of a military plan, but also after. In the course of this process, it is necessary to examine anew whether the plan worked out in the preceding process corresponds with reality. If it does not, or if it does not fully do so, then in light of our new knowledge, it becomes necessary to form new judgments, to make new decisions, and to change the original plan so as to meet the new situation. Fortunately, the Americans did change the original plan. They recognized the proper center of gravity, and they made a mid-course correction. Um, they sent in the uh, famous surge, the 30,000 additional troops, which were important less for the additional numbers than for the change in strategy. The U.S. went over to a thorough and consistent counterinsurgency strategy in Iraq, something it had tried 
uh, only uh, partially up to then. I call this a mid-course correction, but it would be more accurately called a late-course correction. The Bush administration was distressingly late uh, in changing course, not until the end of 2006 uh, did the impetus for the surge come. And finally, uh, in Iraq, well, next to finally, let me say that uh, I believe that the surge has been very successful uh, in improving things in Iraq, and that we're now at a point in Iraq in which we have a genuine yet fragile and reversible success in this war, reversible victory. Fragile, genuine, yet reversible victory. But let us make one other point about the Bush administration in Iraq. The Bush administration made a huge political error in forgetting another element in Clausewitzian doctrine, and that is Clausewitz teaches us that war is always a trinity. It consists not only of the government and the military, but of the people and that no state should make a war without remembering the need to maintain public support, the Tao of administration, if you will, in the terms of Sun Tzu. The mistake the Bush administration made in this uh, effect uh, in this area can be illustrated by the fact that today 59% of American public opinion says the war in Iraq was a mistake. So let me turn briefly at the end to Afghanistan. It's unfortunate that American policy in Afghanistan has left Osama bin Laden, as far as we know, still alive, with his lieutenants in place in the Pakistani borderlands. Uh, indeed, uh, the Pakistani borderlands nowadays can be said to be an area that is being Talibanized. This is an area in which, far from being weakened, the Taliban is growing in strength. And it's been able to engage in additional attacks uh, on Afghanistan. Uh, presumably with the support of al-Qaeda. In fact, uh, and the situation in Afghanistan is deteriorating. In fact, just yesterday, the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, Admiral Mullen, testified to Congress, and he said, quote, I am not convinced that we are winning in Afghanistan, but I am convinced that we can win. Now, as I said before, the United States uh, has had a hands-off policy towards Pakistan, in part because it didn't want to destabilize the Musharraf regime. That worked nicely, didn't it? Uh, and in part uh, because it prioritized the war in Iraq. There's been much speculation ever since the summer that President Bush has taken the decision that he will now reverse things and do everything he can to try to capture or kill Osama bin Laden before he leaves office. Perhaps he announced earlier this week uh, that he'll be transferring 4,500 troops, I believe it is, 4,500 uh, army soldiers uh, from Iraq to Pakistan, excuse me, to Afghanistan, but the United States is now making further incursions into Pakistan, so that slip of the tongue was actually an accurate one. Um, and there are, I believe, five to a thousand Marines who are also going there in uh, November, but this is much smaller uh, than the American commander in Afghanistan wants. He wants at least another 10,000 troops. The question now is what the United States will do whether the United States will make a greater effort in Afghanistan and will shift more troops from Iraq to Afghanistan. Of course, the answer to that question will only come after the election in November. Mm. Let me make a final point, uh, a controversial point, and that is for all the fact that we haven't succeeded in Afghanistan, for all the fact that we've prioritized uh, the war in Iraq, uh, and for all this is the stress that this has caused us, I actually think it was the right move. I supported the war in Iraq at the time. I'd continue to support it. If I had to do it over again, I would prioritize Iraq over Afghanistan. I wish the Bush administration, certainly wish it had uh, conducted the war in Iraq with much uh, more intelligence than it did. And I wish it, we were in a position to move to, uh, resources to Afghanistan more quickly. But that's the way I see it seven years after 9-11. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. <coughs> Uh, let's, let's applaud all three of our panelists when they've, when they've gone collectively and turn to Peter. Well, sitting next to Barry is like encountering an old girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> my dear! <laughs> you know exactly what kind of move she's making, but you're not sure that you're liking it, so... Uh, uh, so rather than go there right away, I actually want to start on the somber note that while I was preparing this talk this morning, it was very somber music on NPR. And my mood is very somber, despite the initial joke. Um, 
I told my students yesterday uh, that, or two days ago, I think this is the first time that I can talk about 9-11 without crying in public. Um, I was in New York when it happened, and it was difficult. But when I saw it on the Upper East Side about five minutes after it happened, the first plane, uh, I right away said, as a political scientist that I am, it's Pearl Harbor all over again. The media were still there for two and a half hours talking about alleged accidents, uh, even after the second plane crash. Uh, but it was so evident to me from the moment that it was Pearl Harbor and this would have a fundamental effect on us. Uh, uh, so 9-11 changed us and that is what I want to talk about in the next 10 minutes. I do not think, and I fully agree with Barry, it didn't change the world. So what are people sad about in San Diego today? They're not sad about 9-11 and the attacks in New York and Washington and the fields of Pennsylvania. They remember the attack on Chile by the United States. Okay. What are people in Berlin happy about today? They're not happy about the attacks on the World Trade Center. They're happy because 9-11 is the day in which the wall broke. So the meaning of 9-11, which we think remade the world, it remade us. It didn't remake the world. Terrorism, mass terrorism has been around for a long time. Countries have lived with that. Uh, and it's just the preconception of an American psyche which takes itself too centrally and too important to think that the world revolves around America. Yesterday on email, I got the latest uh, world public opinion poll from people. International poll, no consensus on who was behind 9-11. I'll just read you the summary. A new world public opinion poll of 17 nations finds that majorities in only nine of the 17 believe that Al-Qaeda was behind the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the United States. In no country does a majority agree on another possible perpetrator. But in most countries, significant minorities cite the U.S. government itself and in a few countries, Israel. These responses were given spontaneously to an open-ended question that did not offer response options. On average, 46% said that Al-Qaeda was behind the attacks, while 15% said the U.S. government and 7% Israel, and 7% some other perpetrator. One in four say they didn't know. Even in European countries, the majorities that say Al-Qaeda was behind 9-11 are not overwhelming. 56% in Britain, and Italy, 63% in France, 64% in Germany. However, significant portions in Britain, 26%, France, 23%, Italy, 21%, uh, say they do not know who was behind 9-11. Remarkably, 23% of Germans cite the US government, as do 11% of the Italians. Publics in the Middle East, where we apparently were waging such a successful war for the public opinion, are especially likely to name a perpetrator other than Al-Qaeda. In Egypt, 43% say that Israel was behind the attacks, as do 31% in Jordan and 19% in the Palestinian territories. The US government is named by 36% of Turks and 27% of Palestinians. The numbers who say Al-Qaeda was behind the attacks range from 11% in Jordan, close American ally, to 40% in the Palestinian territories. So this is evidence, I think, that what we regard as a transformative event transformed probably us, but it didn't transform the world. There's significant disagreement of what it means, who did it, what the consequences are. So it changed us much more than it did the world. Um, it gave a pur purpose to a floundering president, national security über alles. Uh, I just listened to Ted Lowy's Madison lecture at the ABSA convention, you know, in which he provides a historic explanation about how many republics we have had. We are now, according to his count, in the Sixth Republic. The main theorist of the Sixth Republic, my interpretation, is Carl Schmitt. That is, we have divided the world into us versus them and the axis of evil. The doctrine of the unified executive and the sanctioning of lawlessness in defense of national security has become a very important part of how we have transformed ourselves. And if you want to find out who is in charge of that policy, it's David Addington, okay, who was the chief lawyer for the vice president. But also Berkeley professor, you. The dark side is a nice bestseller on the New York Times laying out the cases. <laughs> 
Uh, now that creating lawlessness for political security reasons is not the first time. I mean, this is how the Weimar Republic ended. Uh, the Weimar Republic didn't end in 1933, it ended up in 1930, a state of emergency. And we were in a state of emergency for several years before the political opposition and the media rallied. Uh, abroad, the state of lawlessness is man, uh, illustrated by Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib. We chose to sanction illegality, as did Germany in 1914. Now, I'm using the German example not only because of the accent which I have, but because political realism as a doctrine was something which the Germans invented as a coherent doctrine in the 19th century. Uh, it was exported to the United States, two of the most eminent theorists of political realism in the second half of the 20th century, Hans Morgenthau and Henry Kissinger, come from Germany. Uh, but it turns out it wasn't the only import from Germany. That is, the conservative or neoconservative doctrine closely married to the American form of militarism is an import as well. Now, in that political constellation over the last five or six years, there is great disagreement now on the right about what the appropriate foreign policy strategy would be. And I underline foreign policy strategy, not military strategy. The democratic realists around Krauthammer disagree with the democratic globalists around Crystal Kagan. Uh, and this debate, I think it's substantively very important, has not been resolved as it is extremely difficult. Uh, uh, but the reason that we do not have a strategy articulated on the right about what to do about Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan uh, has something to do with the internal splits among conservatives. Um, this comes down to the question, what constitutes victory? Uh, victory means obviously no weapons of mass destructions, but then they were not there in the first place, and Barry did not mention that there was the first public objective of the war. It was the only thing in which the right could agree, actually. That's, that's why it was used as an objective. Uh, it clearly does not mean a stable democracy in Iraq. Uh, it may be an unstable democracy, or an unstable quasi-democracy, or a tottering on civil war if the Americans leave. Uh, uh, victory means no civil war in Iraq. I think this is true. And it means no high casualties for American troops. Um, so without a definition of victory, uh, it is hard to measure success and failure. Barry indicated that Al-Qaeda had failed. I think Al-Qaeda has also succeeded. Uh, by wiping out the organizational structure of Al-Qaeda, which the Americans have done incredibly effectively, uh, I think we caught number three six times in 18 months. Okay? Uh, the organization has flattened out as all large organizations which uh, are interested in profit maximization have done in the last 20 years in the era of globalization and replicate itself ideologically. Al-Qaeda cannot be defeated because it's by now an ideological frame, not an organizational unit. Uh, and so in that sense, victory is extremely difficult if you choose war as the metaphor. Uh, in Europe, where we, Europeans are less infused by military values after 70 million Europeans killed in the 20th century, they would define this not as war but as a campaign. And they would say the campaign will be fought by law and order forces and intelligence services. Uh, and m terrorist organizations have a life cycle of 20 to 30 years. This is a long, longer version. The Japanese have gone through that, the French have gone through that, the Brits have gone through that, the Germans have gone through this. Uh, Al-Qaeda is a different kind of terrorist organization, but it is a long-term engagement. And to commit yourself to fighting a war for 20 to 30 years is something which very few societies are willing or able to do, including the American. The erosion of the support for the war was predictable. We are not prepared to fight a war for 20 or 30 years. We might be prepared to engage in a campaign for 20 or 30 years. Uh, so what about the democratic opposition? How was it affected by 9-11? I think the first one is it submitted or it subjected and was part of a politics of fear just as on the right. I think we were all afraid. Uh, 
And the politics of fear led to the erosion of a democratic opposition. Uh, uh, it was only when the president showed political weakness that the media and the opposition started having gumptions to challenge the policy. That was three years into the war. Um, the debate about Iraq, since everybody in the country, the political elite, believed in the existence of weapons of mass destruction, as did I. Okay? The debate was not about the existence of weapons of mass destruction, but whether they were weaponized. And that debate was fought in Congress, and Joe Biden, God bless him, actually was articulating that argument very clearly that there was no compelling evidence, even if you believed that he had weapons of mass destruction. Uh, having weapons of mass destruction, being able to create an imminent national security threat are two very different things. Uh, this was deliberately elided by the government, but it was taken up by the opposition. On that core point, the opposition actually articulated the position. The Democrats are committed to law and civil liberties, uh, uh, but they did sign up on the Patriot Act. The left of the Democratic Party and the right on the Republican Party resisted. Uh, and imposed limits on the Patriot Act, but the center of the, of the party went along without a sustained debate about how much of our liberties should be sacrificed for how long, given the security needs. I personally believe there needs to be concessions, okay? But the opposition never actually engaged it. It was like a free lunch. You could be secure and have all your liberties. And that's how Democrats typically think about this. I think this is foolish. Um, so no clear position on that. And now on the commitment to Afghanistan, which is a centerpiece of Obama's uh, uh, critique, uh, uh, there is no policy. It is simply saying we need more troops in Afghanistan. Uh, that is to say we will fight another 20 or 30 years in Afghanistan. Uh, the key political problem in Afghanistan and in Pakistan is to dissociate the Taliban from al-Qaeda. The war terror focuses on al-Qaeda, doesn't focus on the Taliban. The Taliban happen to be the host. Uh, but the Taliban is a very different political organization, and it will take, I think, a different kind of political strategy in thinking about it, uh, not to put them in the same pot. And increasingly, I think, they're being put in the same pot by the Democrats. Um, now, our domestic debate, therefore, I think, is confused and incoherent and this is not a surprise. I mean, uh, I will listen with great interest to what Steve Krasner has to say about a grand strategy in the United States, but I think in the end he'll probably come down where Jonathan came down after 10 seconds. Uh, but it is historically pre-programmed. That is, we were incoherent in our domestic debates in the 1990s uh, over Bosnia, over Rwanda, over Kosovo. The old left in the Democratic Party said, don't intervene. They were operating under the Vietnam syndrome. The new left, the humanitarian left, said, do intervene. This was a human rights campaign. The new right in the Republican Party said, do intervene because our values are at stake. The old right said, don't intervene because U.S. interests are not central. And so you had on the talk shows in the second half of the 1990s very awkward alliances. Suddenly people were sitting next to each other and saying, I used to sit opposite. Why are you on my side? But this moment of trying to figure out why left and right had switched past, we never actually had more than these odd couples. And we've paid a price for that. That is, our politics, you know, didn't generate consistent on longer-term public debates to help us figure out the strategy which we wanted to adopt. Let me conclude with one observation. That we are politically incoherent is a constant, not a variable. That is what marks us as a country. What's not a constant is that we've become a world power. That was a long-term process consummated at the end of World War II. Large powers have a great advantage, a luxury. Uh, they have much more flexibility, their security margin is much greater. If you're a small power, all you worry about is your interest. You want to survive. Think of Poland. Poland lives between Germany and Russia, and the only thing Poland historically wants to is survive. And that means no 
No luxury of ideological, no politics of fear, no politics of imagination, just national interest. The United States, as it becomes a world power, has much flexibility, is not threatened in its core value, survival, and therefore is free to export its fears, its hopes, its aspirations, and its dreams, and thereby ends up making foolish policy. Before I get started, I just wanted to point out there are some empty chairs here and here, and there's also a rack of chairs there, so feel free to, to pull one out and, and sit down. <coughs> uh, when I first started teaching uh, over 20 years ago, uh, I read a book about how to teach, and one thing that I learned is that an audience attention span tends to decline uh, over time, uh, no matter how stimulating the material or the lecture style, uh, and that you can it, bring it up not all the way, but part way up by uh, an anecdote or a joke or, or doing something uh, dramatic. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at the end of a panel uh, of far less stimulating speakers than my uh, colleagues here, and I was feeling a little bit desperate. Uh, and there was a, a metal tray on the edge of the, the table that had held glasses of water, and I kind of nudged it over the edge onto the floor to, <laughs> to, to try to wake the audience up. It's obvious we don't need to do anything like that for this uh, attentive audience. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, both Barry and Peter talked about al-Qaeda, uh, its strategy, what was the nature of the threat, how it's evolved over time. Because a lot of uh, discussions of the impact of September 11th tend to focus on the United States. The reaction was so dramatic, so all-consuming, uh, and controversial that much of the focus has been on the United States, the nature of the policy, some of the things uh, that Barry and Peter talked about, the conduct of the wars, the use of torture, Abu Ghraib, um, extraordinary renditions, uh, those kind of things. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes it seems that uh, the United States uh, is, is the main concern when we talk about the legacy of September 11th. Uh, that's certainly been my approach, uh, and that's uh, what I've written about uh, recently, uh, all of those issues, and thinking in particular about uh, how much staying power uh, the U.S. Uh, policies have had, what the reaction internationally has been. Uh, for my comments today, I'd like to focus uh, on one uh, particular topic, and that's uh, the norm of preventive war as a way of dealing with terrorists. Uh, almost six years ago, uh, three out of four of us uh, participated in a roundtable discussion in this room uh, on the topic of uh, the recently issued document called the National Security Strategy of the United States of America. Uh, it emphasized the preventive use of U.S. military power uh, which it called preemption, and it was clearly intended in part to justify the forthcoming war in Iraq. Uh, Jonathan, one of the participants, uh, sharply criticized the preventive war doctrine uh, and the planned invasion of Iraq as dangerous departures from previous U.S. policies of deterrence and containment. Uh, Barry, uh, another participant, was more sympathetic to the use of military force in Iraq uh, to serve the interests of U.S security and uh, Iraqi democracy, but he did express some unease about the preventive military action uh, as, a, as a norm. Uh, the sharpest disagreement, though, it seemed to me, uh, came not between Jonathan and Barry, but between Jonathan and the third participant, uh, visiting professor Maria Fani. Uh, Maria argued that the post-9-11 policies did not represent such a departure in U.S. foreign policy, especially uh, in the wake of the end of the Cold War. Promotion of open markets, rhetorical support for democracy abroad, and even the preventive use of force characterized, in her view, both Democratic and Republican administrations. Uh, some observers uh, would go further and say that preventive war was a common U.S. practice during and even before the Cold War, uh, in Latin America, for example, uh, when the U.S. overthrew left-wing or reformist regimes to prevent them from going communist, as we used to say. Uh, and Peter has already alluded to this. If not for the attacks of September 2001, and even with them, uh, many people, especially in Latin America, would be commemorating a different 9-11. September 11th, 1973, 
when the Chilean military overthrew the elected president, Salvador Allende, at the behest of U.S. President Richard Nixon and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. It was a form of preventive use of force, whose origins are well documented now in recently declassified records uh, from Kissinger's telephone conversations. Despite that tradition of preventive use of force, uh, many observers saw the invasion of Iraq as something different and wondered whether it would set some kind of precedent. Uh, I didn't have anything to say at that panel six years ago. I was doing what Jonathan's doing and chairing it. Uh, so now I have my chance. Uh, what I'd like to do is pose the question, what is the status of the norm of preventive use of military force uh, seven years after the 9-11 attacks uh, and five and a half years after the invasion of Iraq? In his cover letter to the National Security Strategy document that my colleagues discussed here in 2002, President Bush asserted that, quote, the gravest danger our nation faces lies at the crossroads of radicalism and technology. Our enemies have openly declared that they are seeking weapons of mass destruction, and evidence indicates that they are doing so with determination. He vowed uh, that as a matter of common sense and self-defense, America will act against such emerging threats before they are fully formed. Uh, many observers, including Jonathan at our panel, responded by pointing out the great degree of uncertainty inherent in the concept of an emerging threat not yet fully formed. When a country faces an imminent threat of attack, troops massing on the border, missiles or aircraft being readied to launch, it is legal for them to attack first, preemptively, or engage in what international law calls anticipatory self-defense. When I first heard that expression, I thought it was one of these Orwellian uh, terms, but in fact, it, it exists in the literature, and the, and the concept uh, makes sense. Countries are not obliged to wait until the, uh, the army pours over the border or the planes start bombing if it's clear that that's the intention. Uh, preventive war, though, against emerging, not yet fully formed threats is, according to legal experts, unlawful. International opposition to the U.S.-led war in Iraq was, as you'll remember, uh, widespread, and one of the arguments against was its illegality. So the first question we want to pose is when the world's largest military power breaks a norm governing warfare, does that mean the norm is dead, that it no longer operates? Not necessarily. Uh, prominent violations of a well-established norm, if met with strong condemnation, often serve to reinforce it. Uh, you know this from basic examples in our everyday life. Uh, just because there are lots of murders in the United States doesn't make the practice any less a crime. We punish murderers to reinforce the norm against murder. In the international system, the situation is somewhat more complicated because there was no enforcement mechanism equivalent to arresting and putting on trial a murder suspect. But there are ways that states can make their views known about the status of an international norm, by what they say about it and by their own actions vis-a-vis -vis that norm. In the case of the U.S. preventive war against Iraq and the subsequent military occupation, the response of other states and international and non-governmental organizations was ambivalent. Although the United Nations Security Council refused to endorse the invasion, it did effectively endorse the occupation. The Security Council established the United Nations Assistance Mission for Iraq in August 2003, uh, just a couple of months after the end of the fighting, the initial fighting, uh, to aid in post-war reconstruction. Security Res Council Resolution 1546 was adopted unanimously in June 19, uh, 2004. In the summary provided by the U.S.-run uh, Coalition Provisional Authority, the CPA, uh, the resolution, quote, endorses the new interim government of Iraq, allows the multinational force to provide security in partnership with the new government, sets out a leading role for the U.N. in helping the political process over the next year, and calls upon the international community to aid Iraq in its transition. Unquote. 
Uh, the Security Council also indicated in the document's opening paragraph uh, that it was, and I quote, looking forward to the end of the occupation and the assumption of full responsibility and authority by a fully sovereign and independent interim government of Iraq by June 30th, 2004. Uh, a fact that was not mentioned in the CPA's summary introduction. The Security Council subsequently issued extensions of its endorsement several times uh, to allow the continued presence of foreign troops as Iraq continued to fail to achieve sovereign status. Uh, now, as you know, the Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki is trying to assert Iraq's sovereignty by insisting that the UN mandate that runs out at the end of this year be the last one. And then that's why the negotiations are going on about a continued troop presence there and what would be its legal basis. Uh, some observers have seen the Security Council's actions as consistent with what they have called an emerging consensus for preventive war. Uh, Peter Dombrovsky and Roger Payne in an article have gathered considerable evidence of the sort that should be relevant. In particular, official pronouncements by various states and international bodies on the acceptability of preventive military action for certain purposes. First, they point out by the Bush administration's calculations, 48 countries supported the invasion of Iraq, even if far fewer actually provided any military contribution, the so-called coalition of the willing. I think a lot of us sort of smirked when the, when the Bush administration people said, you know, came up with all those 48 countries because some of them are micro states in the Pacific Ocean and that kind of thing. Nevertheless, it's a, it's a pretty reasonable chunk of the states in the international system endorsing a war fought on preventive uh, motives. And we know, of course, that uh, the prime ministers of several major states, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, and Italy, came out with explicit statements of support for U.S. interpretation of a right of preemption, uh, and several states uh, sent troops, uh, Poland, the Republic of Georgia, as I learned yesterday, one of the more prominent supporters. Uh, several other countries facing threats of the sort that the United States imagined emanating from Iraq uh, vowed to pursue preventive measures to deal with them. Uh, Israel threatened preventive action to forestall Iran's acquisition of nuclear weapons, and it had the power of precedent to back up that threat uh, in 1981, Israeli air forces had destroyed Iraq's Osiric reactor using the same justification. Indian Defense Minister George Fernandez similarly threatened neighboring Pakistan. He also implicitly supported the discursive ploy adopted by the United States to blur the distinction between uh, prevention and preemption by using the latter to mean the former. He claimed, for example, that, quote, more than Iraq, Pakistan is a fit case to launch preemptive strikes. Recently, we've learned that not India, but the United States has, in fact, launched attacks against Pakistan's territory and that the Pakistani army has vowed to defend it. You'll remember that these sorts of attacks were something that the Republicans criticized candidate Obama for proposing to do, uh, but now they seem to be a bipartisan policy. In 2005, then-Russian President Vladimir Putin declared that his country also favored preventive action, that it had the right to attack neighboring states such, such as Georgia or Ukraine if it finds that they are harboring terrorists who might pose a threat to the Russian Federation. Russia followed through with its attack against Georgia last month, as everybody knows, without appealing to the threat of terrorism. The chief of the Russian general staff had gone further than Putin, indicating that Russia could launch preemptive strikes on terrorist bases anywhere. Speaking of preemptive strikes, he said, Russia will take all necessary steps for destroying terrorist bases in any part of the world. However, he added reassuringly, it does not mean that we are going to use nuclear weapons during counter-terrorist operations. But what a wild idea. Uh, nuclear attacks against terrorists. I should mention, though, that the Bush administration did advocate uh, creating a new type of nuclear weapon, the so-called robust nuclear earth penetrator, precisely to attack terrorists, to destroy deep underground facilities 
that might hide them or their weapons of mass destruction. Uh, no other countries that I know of have endorsed nuclear attacks against terrorists, uh, so if the norm of preventive war seems to be catching on internationally, at least its nuclear variant remains uh, less popular. Uh, so far, we've looked at three pieces of evidence that seem to support uh, the notion of preventive war uh, as an emerging norm. Uh, I want to mention uh, one more, uh, and that's the documents that international organizations have, uh, have put forward, and in particular, uh, the high-level panel on threats, challenges, and change that the UN Secretary General put together. Uh, in its report, it essentially acknowledged that in the world of 21st century, the international community does have to be concerned about nightmare scenarios combining terrorists, weapons of mass destruction, irresponsible states, and much more besides, which may conceivably justify the use of force, not just reactively, but preventively and before a latent threat uh, becomes imminent. Can we argue then that the U.S. war on terror and the way the Bush administration sought to put it in practice with a preventive war against Iraq contributed to an evolution of international law. Is preventive war now considered more acceptable than in the past? Is it no longer considered a violation of customary law, the laws that aren't codified in treaties but are accepted in practice? Uh, the safe uh, and correct answer is that it's too early to tell. Uh, international legal scholars and political scientists have produced excellent work seeking to establish the conditions of factors that influence the formation and erosion of customary norms, but there's basic disagreement on such fundamental questions as how many states have to validate a new norm before it can be said to have acquired the status of a new rule of customary international law. In the case of preventive war, do states believe that it's now become accepted practice, legally sanctioned, or do they see the actions as exceptional? given the particularly grave combination of terrorist threats, failed states, and weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we're complicated, the, the answer is complicated by the fact that people still disagree about what constitutes preventive action. Uh, it leads to a paradoxical situation, which is the last thing I want to mention. In considering prevention and preemption, a number of international organizations have sought to broaden the concept beyond military means. Uh, for NATO and the European Union, for example, uh, Dombrovsky and Payne argue that one can now identify what they call a uniquely European style of preemption. Preemption, and they really mean prevention, of the formation or acceptance of terrorist ideologies and cells in the world's poorest regions through early crisis intervention and peacekeeping, humanitarian aid, and nation-building activities. The high-level panel I mentioned endorsed an even more expansive conception uh, when it wrote that preventing mass casualty terrorism requires a deep engagement to strengthen collective security systems, ameliorate poverty, combat extremism, end the grievances that flow from war, tackle the spread of infectious disease, and fight organized crime. If preventive measures include such non-military means of forestalling the rise of terrorist threats, and if they come gradually to eliminate the perceived need for preventive wars, that would allow the self-defense norm to remain robust while allowing states to cope with the new threats that face them without engaging in those kind of preventive wars as we saw in Iraq. But those are two very big ifs. Uh, even our presidential candidates aren't willing to make promises like that. And if we don't eliminate the causes of preventive wars, I do anticipate we'll see a lot more of them as one of the more enduring legacies of the 9-11 attacks. Okay. Thank you to uh, all of our panelists. Um, I'm going to try and recognize people for questions now. Before I do, I want to make two uh, quick comments about that. One is to remind you all uh, of the ambiance of this room, which is one of uh, constructive engagement of differing views. And secondly, because time is short and because people's passions may be running high, I'd like you to please focus questions that you have, emphasis on the word question, uh, to those that are relevant to the comments of the panelists in their presentations. These are, these are questions to our panelists. 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of uh, disturbed to hear a discussion of Iraq, and not to mention the word oil and all of these presentations. Oil and the control of oil resources played a major role, not the only role, but an important role in what's happening and what happened. The other issue about Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda has uh, mentioned that it's a concept now, more so than uh, on-ground type, really, uh, forces. And that because there are millions of Muslims, they are on the edge to become an active Al-Qaeda member for many reasons. Some of it related to the policies of the West, especially the United States, in the Muslim world. Some of it related to dynamics of Islam, how it's being perceived and practiced. We have to look at that aspect, and that's really completely absent, more or less. There is no hope for us in the near future to address this issue and the dynamics of forming more and more uh, so-called enemy. Anybody? I didn't hear a question. Why didn't we talk about oil? I, I, oh. I, I can speak for myself. I, I think clearly it was implicated in a big way uh, in Iraq. Uh, but I, I, I admit that I don't know quite how to deal with it. The, the companies that, that produce oil and deal with the oil industry, like Halliburton, uh, you know, they make money during peacetime, they make money during wartime, they make money during reconstruction of the oil fields that they help uh, destroy. And I, and I frankly just don't know how to, how to address that. A lot of other issues that, w that we've seen in the news recently, Russia's invasion of Georgia seems also to have something to do with oil because there's a pipeline uh, in southern uh, Georgia that runs from the, from the Caspian Sea. Um, so it's clearly there, but um, in some respects it's almost a constant. I don't think it had anything to do with the overthrow of the Chilean president, but it, it's there a lot, and so I, I appreciate your raising it. Uh, next on my list is me. Uh, I have a question for... <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Barry. Um, Barry's, um, would, if I heard you correctly, you seem to be stressing continuity over change, and I just wanted to run by the one discontinuity that, that, that has really disturbed me post 9-11 that I think matters for uh, America, and I, uh, this seemed like a good opportunity to ask. We, what seems to me different, and Matt may, Matt may disagree since we might have disagreed on this in a, on a different panel, um, that what, what the United States is currently asserting is the right to gather up bad guys around the world. Um, detain them without explanation or recourse, mistreat some of them, and do so indefinitely. And I, that seems to me to be very different. And it seems to me that when I was a kid, you know, we would, we would just describe that behavior. That would be describing the behavior of states that we would be labeling as really bad. And I'm concerned, and, and no, I'm, I'm, this is a very serious question, in terms of the U.S. conduct of its behavior in the world in the wake of 9-11. That strikes me as being very different, and it strikes me as being possibly very consequential, simply for the way in which we're positioning ourselves or articulating our moral claims around the world. So what's the question? <laughs> the question is, you spoke to continuity over change in terms of the U.S. reaction or behavior after 9-11. And to me, although Matt made, I, I don't know if Matt agrees or not, but this strikes me, this the assertion of this right, to me, seems to be a, dis a consequential discontinuity in the way in which the U.S. is conducting itself on the world stage. And I, I think it's a, a bad thing. I think it matters. And, I, and since I, th I thought I heard you making the point for saying this was, that there was always in continuity. So you, you, you don't think, well, first of all, I just don't know enough about international law, I think, to really give you an intelligent answer to that question uh, as to what the legal grounds for American behavior has been. Um, but I wonder whether um, uh, the American apprehension of, uh, of people uh, and the detention in places like Guantanamo was really all that different from the way the United States behaved in earlier wars in World War II, for instance. What's, I'm not, I've never been entirely sure what the big difference is. So I guess I'd go for continuity. Okay. 
Well, he, he fell right into your trap. I would have answered if I were you that I was talking about continuity and the, the rules governing war and how we understand why wars are successful or not, and I didn't touch that other subject. I fall into many traps. I'm not a political scientist. I'm just a, I'm just a, I'm just a simple historian. Before I recognize Dave Patel with the next question, I forgot to preface my question with a comment that Barry and I appeared on a post-9-11 panel uh, in 10-11, and I said that there was going to be another big terrorist attack coming soon, and you said, no, there wasn't. So you're, 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 you know, you're already ahead of me on the scorecard of predictions about the future. Uh, Dave, <laughs> what's up? I was thinking about Peter's presentation and how it would be different if it was given in Jordan or in Egypt. And I think the way they would respond to it is that even if there's been an identity change in the United States, a change in perception, it hasn't led to any change in policy. And they would start out by talking about U.S. support for dictators in the, in the, in the region, support for authoritarian regimes, and how the threat to the existing regimes was perceived to be worse, first communists, then Islamists. And they would say nothing has changed at all. The U.S. is intervening in the same way. In fact, it's intervening in the same place as it did before. And the states that are backing that intervention are the same states who have always historically colonialist regimes and those who want to be colonial regimes are these western states like Poland. And, 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 the, and the Mongolians. The last time uh, the last time the Mongolians came to Iraq, they sacked Baghdad. The U.S. helped do them again. And they would say this language of, of transformation of Al-Qaeda into a, a global Salafi movement, a social movement, is exactly the same way they, they, they phrased leftist reformers and socialists as communists and threats in the same ways in the 50s and 60s. They would disagree with you, I think, and say that the identity change has had any impact. They would say the U.S. is doing exactly the same things it was before, perhaps more so, but it's doing the same things in the same places. And homeland security in, for regimes in the Middle East means something different than here. When they talk about homeland security, it means strengthening the repressive apparatuses of the state. We saw this in China during the Olympics, right? U.S. homeland security companies helping reinforce the regime. Uh, and one final question. I'm curious what each of you think would be the most pressing issue in three years when we start talking about the 10-year anniversary of 9-11. And uh, no one asked me, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you what I'm thinking about based on your comments today. A couple people mentioned uh, the, the unity among Democrats and Republicans of taking the fight to the borderlands and intervening on the ground in Pakistan, at least in that border area. It made me think of a conversation I had with a U.S. intelligence analyst in Washington about six, seven months ago, whose job it is is to, is to basically plan out U.S. ground operations and along the border and in Pakistan. And he said the one thing that shapes everything is, he said the, the recruiting base, the number of people under the age of 18 in Pakistan and Afghanistan is 100 million. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> if you think there's a Talibanization of the region there, uh, along the border, and if you think U.S. intervention is going to uh, allow them to recruit from a wider pool, it's a different ball game than what you see in Iraq, where the population is much smaller. You can do something about the borders with some effort. It's a different ball game than what you had in Afghanistan. The sheer numbers of what you can see in Pakistan when you start talking about U.S. troops on the ground there, it's, uh, it seems to me an order of magnitude. And it's going to take a lot more than 10,000 to to make any difference whatsoever. You know, I mean, among the debate in the right was, you know, Cheney was not gang ho on doing this. He said, Afghanistan, yeah, we need to go in and take out the Taliban and destroy Al Qaeda, but then we should with get out. And then five years later, maybe we have to go in again to drain the swamp, and then we should get out. The notion of occupying Afghanistan st struck many in the vice president's office as lunacy. Okay. Um, and, and this is going to be a big debate because I think, you know, a ground war against an ally uh, or an air war against an ally uh, and against another ally, you're not sure one has nuclear weapons, the other one doesn't, doesn't seem a winning strategy. And so I think the military is never a winning strategy. You have to figure out a political way. And the political way is somehow to disengage the Taliban from Al-Qaeda. You know, did we change? I mean, I'm not quite sure when you say my informants in Jordan say American identity hasn't changed or its behavior hasn't changed. Um, I think American behavior has changed. I think Jonathan is right with this question. Uh, 
Um, and it has cost us dearly in terms of legitimacy, maybe not in the Middle East, but uh, in, in other parts of the world. So getting that legitimacy back, you know, that is actually living according to our values, because I don't think lawlessness is our value, you know, is the first step. But, you know, are there 100 million people ready to become al-Qaeda? Maybe. But those would be the dynamics inside Islam, which are not to be influenced by outside powers. You know, Islam is a very vital, large uh, political force, and you know, we are a very incidental, small bit player. And we, we should be aware of that. Well, I, I'm going to take a, a different take, take on this uh, discussion. It's amazing how much uh, political scientists or international relations scientists are sterile against the human uh, factor in the process of what we are discussing. What I'm aiming at, and basically I'm going to pose my question to Peter, if the U.S. feeling that being a superpower made it foolish enough to not have a good foreign policy which been affected also by its incoherent domestic policy, then how is it now with the U.S. losing that hold on being a superpower will affect its changing these policies, particularly the domestic policy not taking into consideration the civil liberties. Nobody mentioned what happened to five million refugees, Iraqi refugees, or what happened to the 5,000 Muslims who were captured, Muslims and Arabs, after 9-11 fall asleep. Only four of them were finally accused as a, in relationship to 5-11. So how are we going to change that? Yeah, it was directed to me. So I think the, by returning to our values, and our values are being lawful, both internationally and domestic. Uh, that's going to take time, and I think it's a debate. I don't think that you can say, oh, yeah, uh, we will have the same kind of sense of liberty about us as we did 30 years ago. The world has changed. Uh, but you can't actually act in international relation in a coherent manner if you make such a sharp break in the values, which that's a value we've, which we've held to for 200 years. You know, and it was given up in a moment of madness. So how do we hold the both parties accountable to that? Well, through the political process. That's one of the strengths of America. Compared to Germany in 1930, a great strength. You know, I, I was never worried about going from 1930 to 1933 in America. I would have very much in France or in Germany this has happened, or in Italy, not in Britain. That's just, we do it our way. We disagree and we fight. Yes. I have a, a question about, um, about continuity and also about uh, the situation. Um, yesterday it was a very widely reported in uh, Russian press, actually, and probably in Latin American press. Something happened in Latin America, very interesting. That is um, worthy of attention. Actually, there were some U.S. reports about that, and largely not because of Midwest coverage. What happened yesterday that there were uh, two or three Russian nuclear planes landed in Venezuela, two S-2-160 uh, planes, and one of them, uh, they said they held the military exercises there, but uh, Mr. Chavez sat on one of them, and he flew around the Caribbean basin. And what Russian media wrote yesterday, that those planes had the capacity to reach even Chicago with the nuclear uh, targets. So I don't know uh, how, um, uh, how often those things were happening last you know, 20 or 30 years, but uh, it seems to me that has been, uh, Russian media portrayed that as something that did not happen for a long time. Those TU-160 fighters, Came there. there was even a picture of Mr. Chavez sitting in the cabin of a nuclear, um, uh, basically a plane. How would you, I, I'm very interested in all three of your opinion, do you consider this, uh, and this was also timed just before September 11th, 
maybe timing was selected according to a different thing, but for me it was kind of symbolic because September 10th, that, uh, yesterday morning, U.S. time about 11 o'clock, that's when they landed and that during the day that was happening. Do you think that's a continuation of the, of the political trend that started since September 11th? Or is it this a different kind of type of a threat of type of a terrorism or whatever kind of a threat we have right now? Big, one of the big nuclear powers engaging in kind of muscling and muscle resting in uh, South America, basically, very close to America's shores. I would be very interested to hear all three of you, uh, of your opinions. I, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that it's obviously connected to September 11th, except in the sense that the U.S. has been much more active in lots of parts of the world. And I think if we need to think, you know, as you very, very well know, what the Russians thought they were doing and what they thought they were reacting to. And I think, it, to, as to the question of continuity, no, I think it's quite... Uh, unprecedented, in case, unless you want to go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis, to have those sorts of weapons uh, in this hemisphere. And I think it's a kind of flexing of Russian muscle. But, but it's also a response to something quite specific, which was the sending of U.S. military forces into Georgia on Russia's border. And what's interesting about that, and it re relates a bit to uh, the issue that came up earlier, how do we see ourselves, how do others see us? Uh, the U.S. described those missions as humanitarian aid provided by military aircraft and the Russians had better allow them through, provided by military ships and they better make sure those sea lanes are, are open, and the Russians saw them as military challenges. So to answer the question that you, you had earlier, what, should we be, what, what might we be talking about in three years? I think we should be talking about how the U.S couches almost everything now in terms of humanitarian goals. A military challenge uh, to Russia, uh, building up of the Georgian military forces, you know, that's humanitarian. Um, Afghanistan, where the U.S. clearly had a self-defense motive for intervening, it was called a humanitarian aid uh, mission. Uh, the, the First Lady argued that it was to help liberate Afghan uh, women. Uh, and I think it corrupts the notion of humanitarianism to have that heavy military component. And I think it deludes ourselves because we think we're out there helping everyone and they think, you know, you're here killing us. Um, we're, we're out of time and it's not my place to actually speak here, but I'd like to offer a slightly different uh, answer to Matt's question by way of wrap-up, which is that we spent a lot of time debating the functional or dysfunctional nature of U.S. foreign policy. I think the Russian-Venezuelan connection might be seen as a function of the uh, uh, U.S. domestic policies, namely that we're spending a lot of time with our lack of energy policy, subsidizing our geopolitical adversaries, and now we've made them uh, wealthy and, uh, and, and happy to kind of flex their muscles abroad. And with that happy thought, I'd like to thank very much our distinguished panel for a stimulating discussion. Thank you.